Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Christina Wilkinson, Senior Environmental Scientist with DPR School and Child Care IPM program. When I joined the program three years ago, I became the lead person in our program to address questions about proper disinfecting in school and child care programs. So as you can probably imagine, I've been a bit busy lately. Today, I will be helping to answer some of those questions about disinfecting that have come up frequently as school and child care programs are navigating the many guidance documents out there. While I won't be able to answer every question you may have during this 15 minute presentation, I'm more than happy to be contacted directly by email, so please do. My contact information will be given at the end of this presentation. I'll start by giving you a brief overview of DPR school and child care program. Our program is tasked with promoting the adoption of integrated pest management in school and child care centers and providing support for Healthy Schools Act compliance. We do this through various avenues of outreach, training, fact sheets, infographics, field visits, you name it. We help schools and child care programs get the pesticide information they need so that they can maintain healthy learning environments for the children in their care. I mentioned that our program provides support for Healthy Schools Act compliance. The Healthy Schools Act is a law passed in 2000 and amended a few times since that has certain requirements that must be followed when anyone uses a pesticide at a school site. Under the law, a school site is defined as a public K-12 school, public child care center, or private child care center. Family daycare homes do not fall under the law. There are eight main requirements that must be followed, but disinfectants are exempt from all of them except for the training requirement. This leads us to our first frequently asked question. Is training needed before using disinfectants at schools? Yes, the Healthy Schools Act requires anyone using any pesticide, including disinfectants, annually take a DPR approved training course in integrated pest management and the safe use of pesticides in relation to the unique nature of school sites and children's health. This can include school facility staff, teachers, custodial staff, parent volunteers, landscapers, professional pesticide applicators, property managers, anyone applying any kind of pesticide on school grounds. I also want to note that there could be other trainings required outside of DPR's scope. For instance, Cal OSHA may also require workplace chemical hazard training. Now let's get into some definitions. Let's start with what are disinfectants? Disinfectants and surface sanitizers are in a class of pesticides called antimicrobial pesticides. Antimicrobial pesticides are substances used to destroy or suppress the growth of harmful microorganisms. Some examples are disinfecting spray, bleach, food service sanitizer, and disinfectant wipes. If a product makes pesticidal claims about killing germs on a surface, such as kills 99.9% .9 of germs, antibacterial, disinfect, etc., then it is an antimicrobial pesticide. Antimicrobial pesticides are regulated by the US EPA and DPR. Look for an EPA registration number on a cleaning product label. If it has one, it is a registered antimicrobial pesticide. If it doesn't have one, it may be a product that just cleans, not disinfects. Hand sanitizers, however, are not pesticides. They kill germs on the body, not a surface, so are considered a drug and regulated by the FDA, not EPA and DPR. Sometimes the words cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting are used interchangeably, but they actually mean different things. Cleaning means to physically remove dirt, debris, and some germs from a surface by scrubbing, washing, and rinsing. Sanitizing kills germs on our previously cleaned surface and lowers their number according to public health standards or requirements. Disinfecting kills a greater amount and wider range of germs in sanitizing, including viruses. It's important to note that disinfectant products are subject to more rigorous testing requirements and must clear a higher bar for effectiveness than surface sanitizing products. Sometimes a product will have directions for both sanitizing and disinfecting, but there are no sanitizer-only products with approved virus claims. We always need to follow directions for disinfecting if we want to kill viruses. Because schools are most concerned with controlling viruses right now, I will only be talking about disinfecting for the rest of this presentation. You may be asking, why does something like disinfecting require training when used at schools? I can buy it at the grocery store right next to the laundry detergent. Well, the answer is that because we are so comfortable with them, we often forget that they are chemical hazards. If used or stored incorrectly, they can be dangerous. Children are especially vulnerable to chemical exposures due to their developing bodies, natural curiosity, and inability to recognize hazards. Nearly half of all the non-agricultural pesticide injuries and illnesses reported to DPR involve antimicrobial pesticides. 
And since early March, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have also reported that poison control centers have seen a surge in injuries, particularly among children under the age of five. The vast majority of all these illnesses and injuries are due to the products not being used carefully and correctly according to all label directions. Which brings us to how can we make sure we are using disinfectants properly? Three words, read the label. Every antimicrobial pesticide label is required to have certain information on it to let the user know how to use it properly and effectively. The signal word tells us how toxic the product is. Products with no signal word are the least toxic, caution is low toxicity, warning is moderately toxic, and danger is the most toxic. The precautionary statement tells us how to protect ourselves and others when using the product. Look here for what personal protective equipment is required and other safety measures to take before applying the product. The directions for use tell us how much product to use and how to apply it. If we're using a concentrated product that needs to be diluted with water, that dilution rate will be listed here. It's important to remember that there is no one size fits all amount or dilution rate. It varies depending on the type of product, the concentration of the pesticide ingredients, whether we are sanitizing or disinfecting, and what microorganism we want to control. The label will also tell us where we can use it, households, institutions, hospitals, for example, as well as the materials it can be used on, such as hard non-porous surfaces like plastic or porous surfaces such as textiles. One of the most overlooked directions is contact time. Contact time is the time the product needs to remain wet on a surface in order to kill the germs. This is so important. If the surface dries out before the full contact time, the product will not be effective. The contact time is also not one size fits all and varies depending on the product, whether we are sanitizing or disinfecting, and what microorganism we want to control. Finally, every pesticide product is required to have a federal keep out of reach of children warning. This means anyone under 18. These products must be stored in areas inaccessible to children and children must never be allowed to use them or touch or inhale the applied product. We have been getting many questions about how to use bleach properly at schools and childcare centers. First, only EPA registered disinfecting bleach should be used. Not all bleach products are intended for disinfecting, such as laundry bleach, which is intended for whitening clothes. Check the label to make sure it has an EPA registration number and directions for disinfecting. Follow all label directions for effective use to protect yourself and others, and make sure to use the proper amount for disinfection. Using too little could be ineffective and using too much can be hazardous. Using more than is required does not make it work any better. And very importantly, do not mix bleach with any other cleaning products as it can be extremely dangerous. For instance, bleach and ammonia, bleach and vinegar, and bleach and rubbing alcohol all create toxic gases. There's a lot of talk about personal protective equipment right now and applying disinfectants properly may require certain PPE as well. Check the product label for the PPE required to mix and apply a product. Different products require different PPE, and it may change depending on the site and how the product is applied. Always check the label for the PPE requirements to protect yourself. Many schools are wondering how they can make sure viruses aren't transmitted on shared items like toys, art supplies, and books. However, the chemicals in many disinfectants will destroy porous materials like paper and may not be effective on textiles. So check the label for the materials that a disinfecting product can be used on. If the material isn't listed, consider removing it from use and consult public health guidelines for the amount of time before it can be safely reintroduced. Next, let's talk about disinfectant wipes. When using disinfecting wipes, it's important to keep some things in mind. Disinfectant wipes have a required contact time, just like any other antimicrobial pesticide, and run the risk of drying out. A dry disinfectant wipe will not work against the germs. Check the label for the required contact time and use a timer to keep track after application. Be prepared to use multiple wipes to ensure the surface stays wet for the entire contact time. Like any other antimicrobial pesticide product, disinfectant wipes must be kept out of the reach of children. That warning will be on every label. Never allow students to use disinfectant wipes. Also, they are not intended to be used on the body, so please don't do that either. And always wash your hands after use to remove any pesticide residue. We have seen some school guidance that has suggested disinfectant wipes can be made available to students so they can help disinfect shared items. Please, 
Never allow children to use disinfecting products. It is illegal and potentially hazardous. Children can use non-pesticide products to clean, such as baby wipes or soap and water. Pre-cleaning is actually an important step before disinfecting. Disinfectants will not work properly if there's a layer of dirt or dust in the way. If allowed by the school, children may help with this important pre-cleaning step. It can be difficult to find disinfecting products lately, so it is tempting to get a little bit creative. However, some of the ingredients in disinfectants may sound familiar, but trying to make our own disinfectant solutions can be very dangerous. In addition to being dangerous, DIY disinfectants are most often ineffective. Some products create toxic gases or highly corrosive solutions when mixed together. Homemade solutions don't have instructions on how to use them to make sure they are safe and effective. EPA registered disinfectants must go through a rigorous testing and review process to ensure they are low risk and effective if used according to their label. They also contain additional ingredients to help them stay wet on a surface long enough for the disinfecting ingredients to kill the germs. So it's important to use only EPA registered disinfectants and follow all label directions. Finally, schools are looking for ways to efficiently disinfect areas frequently. We have been asked whether foggers, fumigators, wide area sprayers, or electrostatic sprayers can be used to apply disinfectants. The answer is yes, but only if the disinfectant label specifically lists that application method as an option. The product safety and efficacy has not been evaluated for methods not addressed on the label. Always use a disinfectant product according to the directions on the label. So here are the main takeaways to ensure disinfectants are used properly at schools. Be up to date on the Healthy Schools Act training and follow any other local requirements. Only use EPA registered disinfectants. Look for that EPA registration number on the product label. Read and follow all label directions. Never use a disinfectant in a way not listed on the label. It could be dangerous as well as ineffective. And finally, always keep disinfectants away from children. Thank you for your attention today, and hopefully this helped to answer some of the main questions you have about proper disinfectant use at schools and child cares. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I am more than happy to answer any other questions you may have, either in the upcoming Q&A portion of this webinar or by email. Please feel free to contact me anytime. Hi, thanks for joining us. Can you relate to this picture? Finding an ant trail that made its way inside your home or workspace? Have you ever had an ant or other insect problem that just wouldn't go away, so you got so sick of it you used an insecticide? Insect problems can be frustrating. I'm Amanda Kaufman with the Department of Pesticide Regulation School and Child Care IPM program. And as a member of that program, I help train public school staff on how to manage insect pests without relying on pesticides to get the job done. Our team provides resources, training, and is available to answer questions regarding safe pest management practices around children. And today I'll be sharing some of those strategies with you as well. Before we get to how to manage insect pests, here's a little background information. Each year, public schools report their pesticide use to our department. According to the 2018 School Pesticide Use Report, insecticides were the most frequently applied pesticide class at schools, outnumbering herbicide and rodenticide applications. So we see that insects are a major focus of pest management at schools. In this visual, the insecticides are represented in the blue square. Additionally, some insects are a health concern. Cockroaches, for example, can spread disease by walking over contaminated surfaces, transferring pathogens wherever they go. They also carry particles that cause allergies, and asthma. The California Department of Education estimates that $30 million in school funding is lost each year due to asthma-related absences. So having only a few of these insect pests on campus can cause serious repercussions. Common school site insect pests include ants, 
like the common Argentine ant, cockroaches, both indoor and outdoor species, and wasps, like paper wasps and yellow jackets. Most are a nuisance with only a few, like cockroaches, causing a more serious medical concern. Secondary pests, like spiders, show up when there's a regular food source, like flies from a dirty dumpster, and adequate hiding places. Some common spider pests include cellar spiders on the left and widow species, like black widows and brown widows pictured on the right. Black widows are usually hiding in dark, out of reach areas and are rarely a problem. Brown widows can be found in more common areas like outdoor seating and even inside buildings. Both widows have chaotic webbing and an hourglass shape on their abdomen. Black widows produce large, smooth egg sacs, while brown widows have spiky egg sacs. Both are venomous, with the brown widow having a less severe bite because it's a smaller spider compared to the larger black widow. We don't want these getting to the point where they're hatching eggs and their tiny spiderlings dispersed throughout classrooms, playgrounds, and unoccupied spaces. It's best to manage their food source and hiding places before these spiders and other pest populations become a problem. According to the Healthy Schools Act passed in 2000, the least toxic pest management strategy should be the preferred method for addressing pest populations at California schools. This overall strategy is called integrated pest management, which is a combination of actions that focus on keeping track of pests presence by monitoring the facility and making an effort to prevent pests from accessing food, water, and shelter. Before moving forward with prevention or treatment, regularly inspect the facility to locate active pest populations. A great tool for finding out which insects are walking about your campus is the use of a monitoring sticky trap. These traps are pesticide-free sticky glue cards that will catch whatever small insect walks across them. The monitoring traps are a quick way to see what the pest is, where it's located, and where higher populations are concentrating. Remember, some insects are active at night, so using these traps is like having another set of eyes working for you. Check these traps on a regular basis and replace them when they become dirty or full of insects, like the one pictured here. Old, dirty traps lose their effectiveness and may attract other pests like cockroaches to feed on the dead, trapped insects. Place the traps on the floor in out of reach areas that may harbor pests. Even though this kitchen appears clean, pests still may be able to enter. So continue to use monitoring traps, even in clean spaces. If I were to place traps here, I'd place them at the perimeter of the room, behind appliances and under food prep stations and at the perimeter near the entryway. Preventing insect pests also requires managing surrounding landscapes. In this picture, there are overgrown vines, bushes, and weeds around this building, all potential habitat for food and food for pests. Remove vines, trim bushes away from the building, leaving at least a one foot gap, and remove weeds. Weeds like this are food and habitat for insect pests like aphids. Ants are attracted to aphids because of the sweet secretion they produce, a food source for the ants. Eliminate their food source and you minimize the support for an ant colony. Dehydration is an insect's number one enemy. They need high humidity in the air to survive not just physical liquid to drink. This means areas in school facilities that not only have visible liquid, like drains and sinks, but areas with high humidity, like storage closets for cleaning equipment, are hot spots for insect pests. 
This provides the ideal environment for them to thrive. Minimize moisture by thoroughly drying cleaning equipment before storage and mop kitchen floors rather than hose them down, which eliminates excess water found under equipment. Thoroughly clean all drains, remove scum and buildup that provide food and water for pests. Keep these areas as dry as possible. To prevent pests from indoor spaces, exclude them from buildings by blocking their entry points. Gaps under and around doorways, like the one here, provide easy access for insects and other pests. Install door sweeps to prevent crawling pests like cockroaches, spiders, and ants. Mount the door sweep to the exterior of the door with the bristles facing outward. Replace door sweeps when the bristles become damaged and or when gaps are visible. Prevention also requires maintaining window seals and screens to keep crawling and flying insects out. Mosquitoes, flies, ants, and other insects will find their way through even the tiniest hole. Seal indoor and outdoor cracks with caulking, paying special attention to areas around plumbing and electrical access points. Use wire mesh and caulking to fill the voids around these areas. Ants, cockroaches, and even larger pests like rats and mice use these as an entryway to buildings. Here's an example of a building and maintenance project utilizing integrated pest management to exclude and prevent insect and spider infestations. In this picture, there's a widow spider hanging from a foundation wall void. There's plenty of space for it to hide and escape predators and even a pesticide application. After using a vacuum to remove the spiders and webs, the cracks and crevices were sealed using caulking. Larger gaps were filled with gap filler tubes, then caulking on top of that. The caulking was spread evenly to seal all gaps. The surrounding landscape was cleared of weeds and overgrown plants that harbor insect pests by providing food and shelter. Weeds were pulled from the root to prevent regrowth. This is the picture of before implementing the integrated pest management to control spiders and insects. This structure had several spiders, some black widows, down the whole length of the building, as seen in the picture on the left. The landscape was unmaintained, providing food and shelter for insects, as well as tripping hazards for people. No pesticides were involved in controlling the spider and insect pest populations here. By integrated methods of physically removing the pests, eliminating their hiding places and clearing weeds, the spider and insect pest populations were close to eliminated from this structure. However, IPM is a process, it's an ongoing process. Three months later, some spiders returned, but 90% of the control was still maintained. Minor upkeep is still required by physically removing a few spiders and their webs, sweeping the debris away from the building and pulling weeds. Other strategies for removing insects and spiders in out of reach areas is to use a web duster, use it dry to remove spiders and webs, and use an insecticidal soap labeled for wasps to remove wasps and nests from eaves. Install yellow bug light bulbs on the exterior of buildings where appropriate. The yellow light is less attractive to flying insects. To reiterate, insects may be small, but unmanaged populations at school sites can lead to bigger problems, negatively impacting children's health and school funding. Choosing a least toxic pest management strategy should be the preferred method for managing insects on campus because it decreases child pesticide exposure risk and utilizing IPM methods have potential for longer term control of these populations. In the process of managing insect pests at school sites, monitoring is key. Use sticky monitoring traps to locate crawling pests and keep records of what you find. 
Note any patterns month to month, season by season, to stay ahead of common insect pests. Do frequent visual inspections of the exterior and interior of facilities, maintaining these spaces even when they're unoccupied. Unoccupied spaces with easy entry points are invitations for insect pests. Prevent their access to classrooms, kitchens, and hallways by installing door sweeps, ceiling cracks and crevices, especially around plumbing and electrical entry points, and fixing holes in window screens. Vacuum or use other tools to physically remove pests without pesticides. For more information and resources about safe pest management practices at schools, please visit our program website, www.cdpr.ca.gov forward slash school IPM. There's a great new resource on this website, the School IPM Calendar, which includes insect pest identification guides, monitoring resources, and a lot more. Download it for free under the Pest Management drop-down tab. Please send any questions you have to school-ipm at cdpr.ca.gov. On behalf of the California School and Child Care IPM team, thanks for listening. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to the DPR School and Child Care IPM program for coordinating this. And thank you all for attending today. My name is Wade Finlinson, and I uh, serve as the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator for Contra Costa County. Today, I hope to share recent highlights of our ongoing progress in implementing applicable components of the Healthy Schools Act into our juvenile detention facilities. It has required a multifaceted strategy to identify and engage a disparate team of stakeholders. Both the John A. Davis uh, Juvenile Hall in Martinez and the Orrin Allen Youth Rehabilitation Facility in Byron contain schools operated by the Contra Costa County Office of Education. This photo of the Youth Rehabilitation Facility gives a small sample of some of the landscape pest pressures that include gophers, a variety of turf grass ailments, and weeds. Uh, the pests are common, but these school sites are certainly unconventional. Let's start with a seventh grade language arts lesson on the prefix un. I recently learned that un often acts as a morpheme as well. This is due to my upgraded parental role as a classroom aide for my seventh, fifth, and third graders at home. Before discussing a few school sites that are certainly out of the ordinary, it's important to acknowledge that in this unconventional convention season, unconvention is now conventional. While that's a poor attempt at Lin-Manuel Miranda ing, uh, the world is absolutely turned upside down in terms of distance learning and uh, distance integrated pest management. The uncertainty of this situation is, uh, is suitable context uh, to better understand the pesky aspects of nature. Unwelcome bugs, weeds, rodents, germs, and other pests will increasingly afflict our buildings and grounds. It will require a heightened level of collaborative engagement uh, to maintain healthy facilities moving forward. This will involve interdependent strategies that are built on effective communication. Sometimes pests provoke inelegant communication when they are creating problems. Our species has yet to develop a refined system of communicating with the pests themselves. Uh, they don't seem to care about our preferences concerning them. In this evocative composition from Shanna and Robert Park Harrison's collection called Architect's Brother, I imagine the everyman depicted is yelling at the dandelion to stop spreading seeds. The interpretations are in fact limitless. Our best bet is to increase our understanding of each of these bothersome beasts, then engage human stakeholders who may or may not know that they have a part to play in integrated pest management. Like many of your organizations, Contra Costa County is complex. <laughs> the county government consists of 20 departments whose respective missions vary widely in providing services to citizens from Richmond to Brentwood and everywhere in between. 
Believe it or not, many of those listed here do not realize they are IPM stakeholders. They apparently have other noble ventures on their minds. Uh, that said, our integrated pest management program is well structured to work between operational silos and engage the right people in innovative ways. The highlighted departments are those with whom we work the closest. Among other services, the Agriculture Department provides technical guidance, shoulders to cry on, and the Ag Commissioner has a designated seat on our IPM Advisory Committee. Employees from the Conservation and Development uh, Department staff the Sustainability Commission and the Fish and Wildlife Committee, both of which have representatives on our committee, while the County Administrator's Office is the program's formal conduit to the Board of Supervisors. The Employment and Human Services Department manages our Head Start programs, and they have done a remarkable job complying with all aspects of the Healthy Schools Act. I am an employee of Health Services, which is where our program is housed, and our agency has a separate representative on the IPM Advisory Committee. Additionally, the department provides healthcare services at the detention sites, and that medical team is a key component of the Healthy Schools Act compliance. And finally, Public Works uh, does most of the heavy lifting in terms of integrated pest management uh, as they maintain the structural IPM contract for facilities owned by the county, maintain vegetation around buildings, along roadsides, flood control channels, and in airports. They have several seats on our IPM advisory committee, uh, which also includes seven citizen members. One critical component not mentioned in the previous slides because it's a separate independent agency is the Contra Costa County Office of Education. They operate their Mount McKinley schools at each location. This is the John A. Davis uh, Juvenile Hall in Martinez. And this is the Orrin Allen Youth Rehabilitation Facility in Byron. The rectangular photos are from a carbon dioxide injection demonstration. Uh, for man managing gophers and ground squirrels that we hosted at this facility in February of this year. And as many of you know, February of this year was approximately five years ago, or so it feels. Healthy Schools Act compliance within this arrangement is less dependent on the school district since most of the operational functions are carried out by county departments. They are still required to be familiar with the IPM plan uh, for the facilities in addition to ensuring the completion of annual IPM training by their personnel who use pesticides, which is limited to antimicrobial pesticides in this case. Informal methods of outreach to staff responsible for these elements have not been as productive as similar internal communiques. And since they're a separate public entity, it'll be more effective to formally invite them uh, into this dialogue through already established channels within our probation admin team. Uh, we are very much in the early stages of developing the IPM plan for these sites. Uh, just don't tell DPR uh, if you see anybody. Uh, it's never too late to comply. I'll now detail the IPM roles of our probation, public works, and health services departments and briefly describe engagement strategies that have been fruitful. The probation department has custody of the youth in our detention facilities, so they're playing more of a central role in developing the IPM plan. Their staff who use antimicrobial pesticides must also complete the annual IPM training. It took quite a bit of cold calling and follow up to get to the right people responsible for regulatory compliance in this regard, but I was fortunate to connect with willing partners who were happy to champion this effort in their department. Site visits prior to the pandemic were very helpful in gaining familiarity with their operations. The training depicted in the previous slide uh, provided a great opportunity to invite members of their management team to present and it didn't hurt that we left our surplus coffee and donuts with their staff when the session ended. The bridge to discerning the most appropriate IPM tactics to implement is constructed by empathizing with the inherent difficulty in the provision of these services. That is just as important when engaging our public works department. Their staff, understandably, are not fond of my face or voice or emails. I'm always asking for something. This one gets a little more touchy-feely than the others for that reason. And just as IPM is an unending process, these relationships require constant cultivation. I still have a lot to learn about the facilities and grounds maintenance functions. And it seems like maintenance departments in most public agencies are increasingly taxed with having to do more with less. And it's important to acknowledge how they work tirelessly behind the scenes 
to ensure the health, safety, and comfort of these environments, despite real challenges. As we move forward, I plan to continue learning more about their operations so I can work with them to develop a training program that builds morale and strengthens uh, their service delivery. The training component is broader in this department due to the breadth of services rendered. As such, uh, they play a greater role in the development and implementation of the IPM plan. The grounds division and the contracted structural IPM provider are the only ones allowed to use pesticides beyond antimicrobials. Because of that, they're required to keep pesticide application records for four years and annually report usage to DPR. Health services is where I live. That's me. The Healthy Schools Act specifies that the chief medical officer of facilities like this should be notified of pesticide applications 72 hours prior. This is in place of the requirement to notify parents and to post warning signs in treated areas. The highest ranking medical officer for this facility is also the lead physician over detention health services, which include adult detention facilities. I desperately do not want to distract her from what I imagine is quite a workload, so I try to be concise, but also provide links to DPR and other resources that may be helpful. And knowing she may not always be available, we have developed a robust distribution list that includes others from her team in addition to nurses at both sites. Remaining approachable to all stakeholders is a high priority in my role assisting uh, the entire team to fully comply. Regulatory compliance is merely the next step. Uh, just because we don't have to notify parents or post application warning signs, it doesn't mean we shouldn't embrace the spirit behind the legislation by making our information more accessible for all of our applications. After this, our efforts will hopefully move toward enhancing our communication with the public and other similar school sites around the state. We're in the process of revamping uh, the notification section of our website to increase the transparency of countywide pesticide use. And I realize that this type of school site is relatively rare and there are variations around California about how these facilities are managed. Regardless, we hope to build on our current stakeholder engagement momentum and work with other counties to improve conditions in similar locales throughout the state. Nelson Mandela said, no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. It's worth the effort to do better. Uh, presumably, if our detention and rehabilitation facilities exemplify effective IPM uh, communication among stakeholders, the level of service at schools and childcare settings will also improve. And with that, I am finished. Thank you all so much for being here again.